In this video, I'll be answering some awesome questions I received about the MRI in multiple sclerosis. Don't turn away because that starts right now. Howdy! Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. I'm the founder of the Boster Center for Multiple Sclerosis, where we care for families impacted by MS from around the globe. Both in the office and on telemedicine, we're accepting all insurance carriers, and we're currently actively enrolling for clinical trials. Our first question comes to us from Brenda Potter, who asks, should MS centers have MRI machines? Brenda, I think that an MS center that's gonna see a large number of people impacted by MS must have an imaging program, a setup where they can easily refer their patient to a scanner that is ready to receive them, a scanner that is very high quality, preferably a three Tesla machine, using protocols specifically designed to bring out the characteristics of MS. Those I think are requirements. You really wanna use the same scanner for the same patient every time and ideally have the same people reading the scans. At the Boster Center for MS, we have a relationship with an imaging center. Our patients have special protocols they use, scheduling them in during special slots, and the images are not only read by neuroradiologists, but they're pushed directly back to the clinic where I can pull them up and evaluate them and manipulate them, etc. And so I do think that's really important. Guy Davis writes, good morning from Calgary. How does brain volume measured and monitored? Guy, that's a great question. Let me share my screen and I'll explain both. And today I'd like to go over with you two different ways that we measure brain volume. The poor man's way, which is available with every MRI, and then sort of a fancy new way. The poor man's way involves measuring this structure right here, the third ventricle. And so the third ventricle is a space in the center of the brain. And if there's accelerated brain volume loss or brain shrinkage, brain atrophy, this structure will get wider faster than it's supposed to. And so you can take a measuring tool and measure across the widest point. And then you can write that number down. And then on future MRIs, you can measure again and see if it's getting bigger and how fast. Now this person is in their 30s and I can share with you that a third ventricle this wide is highly abnormal. And in fact, this person does have accelerated brain volume loss. Now I'd like to show you another way of assessing brain volume, which is a little bit more uh, mathematically savvy. And that's to use a program like this, the NeuroQuant. Now this is proprietary software, which I've been using for years now. And it looks at the person's brain size and compares it to other people, their gender and age. And so if we turn our attention here to this first graph, it's plotting the size of their brain against other people, their age and gender, and puts it on this graph. And what we can see is compared to other folks, their age, this person's brain is in the second percentile, which means if there was 100 people their age, 98 of them have bigger brains, suggesting that they have a very small brain for age. If you look over here, this is looking at the thalamus, which is a deep structure inside the brain. Here it's colored green on these pictures. The thalamus is a sensory relay structure in the center of the brain, and a large thalamus correlates with a good outcome, whereas thalamic atrophy, shrinkage of the thalamus, correlates with a worse long-term prognosis. And here we see that this person has a very, very small thalamus in the first percentile. Again, meaning if there's 100 people their age, all of them have a thalamus that's bigger than them. The last graph that I'll go over with you is in the center here, and it's looking at the size of the ventricles, actually the space inside the brain, inside the brain. And if the brain is shrinking, not only is the outside of the brain gonna get smaller, but the spaces inside the brain will get bigger, and that's reflected here. This person's uh, ventricles are in the 99th percentile, meaning for their age, nobody has bigger spaces in their head. And so this is a mathematical way of evaluating and monitoring brain volume over time. Both the poor man's way and this way can help guide us in clinic and making clinical decisions. Our next question comes from Rebecca who writes, Hi, I'm Rebecca from Arkansas. Well, howdy, Rebecca. I have RMS and I was wondering about my MRI. Should my neuro be looking at my spine as well as my brain? And the answer, Rebecca, is yes. I think it is required that when you're working someone up for an MS diagnosis, 
that you obtain not just a brain MRI, but a brain, cervical, and thoracic MRI. That way you have the highest likelihood to pick up spots that may show up in the spinal cord. When you have multiple sclerosis and you're being monitored, the consortium of MS centers recommends an MRI of the brain once a year and to repeat the MRI of the cervical spine only when there are new symptoms attributable to the cervical spine. I don't fully agree with that, however. With modern three Tesla imaging, we can pick up lesions in the spine that sometimes in reality do in fact go unnoticed. Not very common, but I've seen it. And so I like to get an MRI of the brain every single year and an MRI of the cervical spine at least every couple years. I think to never look there is to risk missing something. Thanks for the question. Vioha writes, my neurologist asks for a brain and C-spine MRI checkups. Why is only the cervical spine being done and not also the thoracic and lumbar spine? That's a great question. The cervical spinal cord is the thickest diameter. It has the most myelin and statistically, it's the most likely to have spots show up in it. It's more likely for us to see spots there, for example, than it is in the thoracic spine. And it's more likely to see thoracic spine lesions in MS than lumbar spine. And so if you're going to only get one part of the spine, I would always get the cervical spine. Sometimes I get a thoracic spine, but that's really only when there are specific new symptoms that only track to the thoracic spine. It's not something that I do on a routine annual basis. Jillian King asks, what does it mean when the lesions are around two centimeters in size, have mass effect and rim enhancement? So Jillian, this is really getting into the radiographic description of MRI spots. So a T2 bright spot, we sometimes refer to as a lesion. When they say two centimeters, what they mean is they're measuring the diameter, like with a ruler, and that's how big it is. Now, MS lesions tend to be three to 15 millimeters. And so two centimeters is a pretty decent sized lesion. When they say mass effect, what that means is the lesion is taking up space and it's pushing other structures away from it. Rim enhancement is seen after the administration of the contrast dye. If the contrast dye uh, is able to cross the blood-brain barrier because there's been a breach of the blood-brain barrier, some of that dye will leak out into the lesion and we'll call it an enhancing lesion. What they're talking about is the pattern of enhancement with just the rim enhancing, just the edge. And that's what they're describing here. Really, Jillian, this is a neuroradiologist trying to do her best job in describing what they're seeing. Thanks for the question. Alex R asks, why are most lesions in MS created around the vein and capillary? That's a great question, Alex. The reason that we see a lot of MRI lesions that are centered around a blood vessel, so if this is the lesion, the blood vessel's right in the center, is because of the way that MS pathology occurs. So you have a naughty autoreactive immune cell, a B cell or a T cell, and those cells live in your bloodstream. They will attack the brain and spinal cord if they can see it, but they're not in the brain and spinal cord, they're floating in the bloodstream. And there are times that they can cross the blood-brain barrier and gain access to the brain. One of the ways they do that is they're inside of the blood vessel, they're inside the capillary, and then they leak out into the brain tissue. And so it's very common that those immune cells gain access to the brain through the capillaries. And when you take a picture, you see the capillary in the center of that lesion. Excellent question, thanks for asking. Our next question comes from longtime viewer Gift Boutique, who writes, do you recommend a full MRI body scan? I keep hearing about that. And my answer is no. I don't like to order clinical tests, whether they be a blood test or an MRI scan, unless it's gonna change my management, unless the information received is gonna change what I do. And when I order an MRI of the brain, for example, I'm either ordering it because I'm trying to diagnose multiple sclerosis, or I'm trying to monitor to see if there's new spots that have showed up despite taking MS medicines to monitor how the disease is being controlled. When I order an MRI, I'm asking a very specific question. And as such, we protocol or tweak the MRI to bring out the characteristics of what I'm looking for, in this case, MS. So if you got a whole body MRI, I'm not exactly sure which questions you'd be asking. I mean, yes, you could take a picture of the whole body, but I'm not sure that the protocols would be correct to bring out a concern for cancer here, a concern for infection there, etc. I would much rather you get targeted imaging for targeted questions. Just my two cents. If you'd like to learn more about the MRI and multiple sclerosis, click the video that's on your screen right now. 
My name's Aaron Boster, and thank you for learning about MS with me. Until my next video or my next live stream, or the next time I see you at the Boster Center for Multiple Sclerosis. Be safe and take care.